Let's start in early. Matthew needs more time. That offends. Okay. Uh, so uh, our third speaker today, we're happy to have Matthew Harrison Trainer here. Uh, talking about true statements and scripture testing. Yeah. No, I think they're good to me. Um, so I'm just going to start. Uh, okay, so, so we start with um, talking about Borel sets and things like that. Um, so we, today we're going to work in bare space, right? So infinite sequences of, of natural numbers, but uh, I think nothing at all is going to be with in bare spaces. So, but just to say, myself, I'm always writing in bare space. space. Uh, so this is a, a Polish topological space. Uh, it's got the basic Vulcan sets, which say you, you take some finite string. And you look at the set of all strings extending that, and that's all. Right. This is going to be a very important picture in the, in the talk, right? So you have you know, your states of all strings. You pick some particular string. This is your sigma. And then you think about all the strings extending this. This is the, the basic of the set corresponding to sigma. And so in general, right, the, the open sets are unions of these. They're sort of these, these upwards closed sets. Their complements are going to essentially be trace. Right, so the close sets are exactly have through C trait. Do you want to tell it in there? Uh, yeah, it should be. Yeah, so the points are at the points are at. Uh, we're just sort of the tree is like helping us understand the, the topology on the, the points. Uh, okay, so you've got the, the Borel sets. This is the least collection of sets. Uh, I guess I should have said tending the open sets, but you got to start with the open sets. But then closed under tunnel intersections, tunnel unions, and complements. And uh, you can think about how you build them up based on how many intersections and unions you start to construct them. So the, the sigma zero one sets, these are just the open sets. The pi zero one sets are the closed sets. So we say that those correspond to the paths through some tree. Uh, and then if you take you know, the countable unions of sets at some rank, so a countable unions of pi beta sets, then that's going to be a sigma alpha set. And a pi alpha set is going to be a countable intersection of sigma sets at the lower level. Right? So I'm just counting how many times did I alternate between uh, unions and intersections. And of course, right, the complements I can always push down to the bottom. Right? Complement of open is just closed. Um, and the distinction between bold face and light face will be important here. Right? So these are all the, the bold face plural process. Uh, we want some other types of sets as well. So for example, uh, if you have something that's both sigma alpha and pi alpha, uh, we call that delta zero alpha. And then there's also going to be the, the difference hierarchy. Um, so if you have the difference hierarchy with a to many steps over sigma alpha sets, so that's going to mean that you're a difference of a to many sigma alpha sets. So the, the sigma alpha, right, that's the kind of sets that you're forming the difference of. And the eta is how many times that you do things. So then the easiest one to think about is, is sigma one sets. And then what's that kind of saying is that you're you're changing your mind eight and then times. So uh, the final levels are the easiest to see. Um, you can even draw a picture. Okay, so what what might a, a D two over a sigma one set look like? Well, maybe you pick some basic open set like this, right? That's your E one, and then you're going to take away some other open sets. So maybe you take away this, and you take away this. You have something like that. That's a, a D2 over sigma one set. You've got an open set minus some other ones. And then a, a D3 set is saying basically uh, you can put back another set, another open set. So you could put back, for example, this set. Uh, any questions about that? So um, if you if you have sort of the computability theoretic notion, right, then you can think of uh, delta alpha kind of like delta alpha, and and this is the difference hierarchy, right? So if you've seen like DCE or three CE, that's kind of corresponding to what's what's going on here. Um, so the general picture of, of these the Borel hierarchy is so you've got it sometimes you know the sigma one sets and the pi zero one sets. 
you've got the, the delta zero two sets, you have the sigma two sets, the phi two sets, you have the delta three sets, and you have sigma two, phi three, and phi three. And then what's going on, right? So, so this is the intersection of these two, right? If something's this and this, then it's in here. Um, but look, what's in between here? Well, in between here, you've got the difference here. So here you've got, for example, the difference of two different sigma one sets. Uh, down here, you might think of the complement of something like that, right? So this is like the, the dual class. Uh, you've got things that are both in here and their complement is in here. Um, so you do have stuff like this. So essentially you've got this, this whole difference class, right? So the, the E eta over sigma zero one sets, these all fit in here below delta two, but above sigma one. Right? And then in between here, you've got the difference hierarchy over sigma two sets. And here you've got the D eta Sigma zero two sets and so on. Right. So these are, are hierarchies that fit in between sort of the sigma and pi sets and the delta at the f of the set. Do they exhaust the, the, the no, that's a good question? They do exhaust everything. Uh, at least so, so far I'm going to say that we're going to talk later about what happens later on. But uh delta two, right, is exactly if you're delta two, then you're D e, uh eta sigma one versus not eta. Right. So they really do go sort of co harmony up to, up to zero too. And eta is finite it's more uh, eta is something okay yeah any order yeah so this is a whole base delta two so the ordinal might actually be any kind of little yeah and we'll talk about that later also um actually I want to give you a proof of this because the, the sort of structure of the proof is going to be a good illustration of what we talk about later. So uh, let's draw our bare space like this. And say we've got a delta two set. So uh, you can think of a delta zero two set in terms of, of the limit line, um, except that you're thinking of things in bare space. So what actually happens is that along some path, in fact, you know, some element of bare space X, and along this path, you have the limit on the way. So you get, you know, zeros and ones and then zeros and then ones, and maybe from some point on you get all ones because the thing is actually in the delta two set. So you can think, and, and, and the zero here really depends on the initial segment. So there's some function on the initial segment segments, right? So some function that assigns each of these finite strings a zero or a one. And it's the limit behavior of some path that determines whether it's in the delta two set or not. So there is Um, in F, right, it takes finite finite strings and give these zeros or ones. So that, uh, right, I'll say A of X, right, so this is zero if X is not in A, one if X is in A. This is the limit over all initial segments of X of F of that initial segment. Right, so think of the, the whole, like all this space right over here, where you're assigning zeros and ones, and right? maybe this one ends up with zeros in the limit, and so it's not in the same. So this is sort of labeling of the whole tree, and, and it's the, the behavior on the path is what determines whether you're in A or not. All right, so now what I want to look at in this tree is, is there certain nodes where changes happen, right? So here, right, this was the zero, it's predecessor with the one. I'm gonna pick like pick that node out. Uh, here, right, this is where a change happens. It's one, it's predecessor with the zero, that's where a change happens. I'm gonna pick this guy, this guy, this guy. Maybe there, you know, there could have been ones for a couple times in a row. So I'll pick this guy, then I'll pick this guy, but I wouldn't pick that guy. So I'm gonna look at T. It's gonna be the sigmas such that uh, f of sigma is not the same from f of the predecessor sigma. 
right? So from the predecessor of sigma to sigma, things have changed. Uh, so the point is, T is a tree in the sense that um, right, it's it's not a subtree in the sense that like not flow downwards, but it's a tree in the sense that like this is an extension of this, this is an extension of this, and, and so on, right? So it's I mean, there's, there's two notions of trees. One is a subset that's both in their initial segments, but the other is just a mapping of, of right into here that that is a lot of symbols, and it's the second sense that I mean that it's used a tree. Uh, the other thing is that the T is well founded. Right. If I have a path through T, then you're changing your mind every time you go through T, right? On every element of T, you change your mind. So this would be something like, you know, if you have some path here, it can't, this can't happen. I can't go to one and then to zero and then to one and then to zero and so on, because then you wouldn't have this limited system, right? So because it's delta two, because on every path it comes to a limit, this tree must be well founded. So T. And so you can put some rain on it, right? Uh, oh, yeah, the pass. So it has no pass. Uh, yeah. Um, so you can put some ranks on, on, on the elements, right? So uh, let's say this is, you know, there's other stuff going on here, but let's say, uh, you know, this is rank uh, zero, this is rank zero. Say this doesn't happen, right? So that goes on forever. So this gets rank zero. Maybe I should use yeah, the rank bucket. So you use the yellow for the ranks. So this guy gets zero, this guy gets zero, this guy gets zero, this guy gets rank one, this guy gets rank two. And here we have right, the root node will always put in, they'll get ran through. And now I'm going to claim that there's this number three, so the rank of the root node, that's going to be the number of uh, how many differences we're going to take. So, what are we going to do? We're going to take, first of all, uh, U0 is a union of those basic open set sigma, where sigma is in T, and the rank of sigma is zero. So that's you know this set up here and including here. Uh, oh, and I want sorry, and I want the, the number to be one, right? So and one number to be one. Uh, like the, the number that is uh f is a smooth, right? So I actually don't want this guy, but it seems easier over there. Right, so I'm going to take this guy, this guy is one up here, then I'm going to take him. And then here, right, I have this set above here. So that's going to be some other set. Right, and then I have all the things above here. So that's some set. And then I have all the things above here. That's some other set. And then what's my difference? Well, I don't want all the yellow things, but I do want to add back in these. But then I want to take these ones out, but then I want to add back in the silver set. Right. So you can see that there's there's a difference going on here, right? That I'm sort of along this path, I'm changing my mind. Uh, but it's always an open set where the, where the mind change happens. Right. And so that shows that that you this delta two set is a difference. And the rank of this tree is really how many differences you have. Right. So so part of the point of this is that the, the sort of tree structure behind underlying the way that open sets are constructed uh, is very useful for things, right? For, for arguments like this. Uh, so maybe before I keep going, any questions about this kind of argument? So you said chemistry equals the same way, but then then you would only have finite going for it. Uh oh, the, the tree doesn't the tree is like just going to the next level, right? So you could have something where the tree. Right, oh, goes oh, oh, here yeah. and then to here, okay. and right, it goes like, yeah, yeah, here. Okay, right, but, yeah. So, you can actually get it could be you know, very good. All right, uh, and this is true, uh, right, not just for delta two things, but at higher levels. Uh, what's the proof? Well, if you look in like Pepper's descriptive set theory book, uh, it basically was like this. So, you take A that's delta alpha plus one, and then I'm going to change the topology, so I'm going to make more sets open. And this new topology, so that A becomes delta two. 
And then I say, okay, I know what to do when it's delta two. It's going to be a difference of open sets, but open sets in the new topology. And then I say the, the way that I changed the topology is very precise way that the open sets in the new topology were exactly sigma alpha sets in the old topology. Right. And so you were a difference of new open sets. Uh, that means you're a difference of old sigma alpha sets. Right. And that's that's sort of the, the standard argument, right? And so there's this tool change of topology that that basically lets you prove things for some low case where you deal only with open sets, right? When you deal with open sets, you can really take advantage of this, this tree structure, right? Uh, and then you have to push it up to, to higher limits. So what's this change of topology? Um, well, the, the formal statement basically is, is this. So you've got a polar space like, like bare space, and it's got some initial topology T, right? Like this, this topology of the open sets in bare space. And then you've got some countable collection of sets that have to already be Borel. So you have to already be able to generate them with the, the old open sets. Uh, it has to be countable. So you can't make anything you want open. Um, but you can make this B1, B2, and so on open in some finer topology, right? So basically, you add them into the open sets, uh, and it's still going to be a Polish. Uh, oh, yeah, you actually proved the white face version, right? Right there. Uh, if you like are careful about things, right? So, so what was this at? Oh. Right. So this f is actually just some function, but I said it's a whole yeah. case version. Yeah. It's very reminiscent of code that you did. Is there a way of thinking of these statements as a Um Yeah, so they definitely like. So, so one thing I'll talk about at the end is that, that you can't really do Borel convincing to public difference using this kind of handed topology, but sometimes you can do things like this. Um, okay, and, and we also needed something right before. So we made, you know, you, you had this in delta alpha plus one, you made a delta two, but you can do that by making certain things open. Um, but you also need to know, right, the last line said that certain things are open in the new topology where sigma alpha originally in the old topology. So you also need things like that, right? But if, if you're sort of analyzing things very precisely, you can, you can get those kind of things. Um, and part of the point of the talk is to, to explain why you can get that second. Why you can get that the open things in the new topology are sigma alpha things in the old topology. Uh, and I want to explain it in a way that's connected to these kinds of things. Uh, so that's basically what the talk is about. We're going to try to understand this change in topology uh, and, and the tool for connecting it to these sorts of very concrete trees is, is iterated true state arguments. So using sort of a computability theoretic perspective to understand this exchange of approach. Uh, okay, we're also going to need the, the light phase, the effective Borel hierarchy. Um, I don't want to give like a totally formal definition, but basically the idea is the, the effectively open sets. Uh, you take the unions of these basic open sets but the union should be over some C sets. So there's some effective listing of what the union is. Uh, pi zero open sets, you can think of them as complements of effectively open sets. Uh, but equivalently, it's basically saying that this tree uh, that you have to pass through, that should be a computable. Uh, and then at higher levels, right, you're taking countable unions and countable intersections. Uh, basically, the idea is you want some computable listing of, of what you're going to take the intersection. You have to, to do it formally, you have to have this idea of like a name for one of these sets. And then I'm going to give you a list of names, right? And that's going to be a name. So, like uh, a list of names of five beta sets is going to be a name for the sigma alpha set. It's their union. Uh, but basically, you think it's, it's constructed in like a, a way that, that's computably named. Uh, of course, you can also define the light phase uh, delta sets or the light phase difference hierarchies. Um, for all these ordinals here, right? In the light phase one, they should be computable because those are the only ones you can. About uh, and you can also relativize this this ultimate. So maybe you should think that the idea of effective distributed set theory is that if you've got a bold phase set, well then it's going to be light phase relative to some work, right? Because the bold phase set it was a union of intersections in some way, and if X knows how it was built up, right, and X is, is an oracle that's good enough to compute the alpha, then I can be light phase uh, in the same way relative to X. So what you can do is you can apply effective methods, right? Even if you're not initially interested in computability, if you're initially interested just in like bold face notions, well, you can pass the light face notions and then prove something uh, and then pass that. So right, something you asked was uh, this data, what do you know about it? Well, if, if 
you've got a light phase delta two set, then the eta can be chosen to be a computable. I think this is all that you do be your show. I mean, I mean, say they want to put the average. I mean, the right, yeah. I mean, the, the difference hierarchy that the, the, the exhaust, the difference hierarchy exhaust. Oh, right, that, that makes sense. sense. That's already your show here, 1970. Even in the bare space case? I'm sorry? Even in the bare space case, rather than. The, that predates that predates their shop. How's the house order of the is, is the bold face version, the light face version. I think was was a, I mean it's essentially usual. So you want to maybe suit it up a little bit, but it's, yeah, you, I mean, you would probably definitely have done it in the case on like subsets of natural winters. Right, right. Yeah. And you do it in your space also. Or? Maybe not, but I mean it's it's a minor. Yeah. Um okay, so I said I was going to talk about these in terms of connections with with iterated true stages. Well, what what's the like? What what's the connection at all? Like just in a very high level. Well, you can think of sigma alpha plus one sets uh, using the jumps. And so the, the fact is, if you've got a set, it's sigma alpha plus one. If and only if there's some open set, and A is the collection of things whose alpha jump is in the open set. So you sort of think there's, there's this map from bare space to bare space that's taking the alpha of jump. And you take an open set and you pull it back, and that gives you a sigma alpha plus one set. All right, so uh, you can think like the jump sort of moves you up, is, is a map that moves you up through the, the hierarchy. Um, and then, okay, maybe you want to like approximate these jumps. That's what these true stage constructions are good for. So the next part of the talk is going to be talking about these true stage constructions and how they work. And then later on, we'll, we'll sort of connect them back. But, but this, you should think this is like why we might try to do this is, is we want to think about that X to the alpha and we want to try to approximate it. Okay, so um, if you got a, a true stage construction, you might start with the, the you know, computable set and then you're going to take its alpha many jumps. And you can think that at, at each stage, right, you're taking a jump of a jump of a jump. And the limit limit tells you that each stage is a limit in terms of computable in the previous stage, right? But then the previous stage was a limit in terms of the thing below that and so on. So it's sort of like a limit of limits of limits. And the idea of an iterated true stage construction is that you've got all these limits happening at the same time, and you want to figure out how can you organize everything so that they fit together in some kind of reasonable way. Um, and there's all sorts of computably theoretic frameworks that, that would be introduced to, to do this. Uh, maybe I should say, right, so at the first, you know, just alpha is one, that's very easy, that's just a limit. When you get to things like alpha equals two, then you can start saying, okay, that's like sigma three and chi three, and I kind of understand what those feel like. But once you get to alpha being like three or four or five, it's sort of so complicated that it's, it's can't comprehend it in a simple way, you have to have some kind of framework that, that tells you how to, how to make sense of things. So there's all sorts of different frameworks. Uh, for doing things like this. So there's like Barrington worker arguments, uh, trees of strategies, alpha systems, data systems, and then there's uh, uh, sort of variation on the data systems by, by Greenberg and Tretzky. And I'm also going to be talking about things in the style of sort of the, the data systems uh, to the last two points. Um, so that's the kind of style of, of iterated truth that just we're going to need. Uh, okay, so maybe at the first level, right? Because it's just holding down. Uh, we know it's a limit, right? But but it's actually a limit in a very nicer sense, but you only ever change your mind from not into k. So uh, you can approximate it by using right, k is the union of these finite approximations, where you just run things up to stage s and, and you have your finite guess uh, about what's going on. So you could say, okay, I'm going to try to, you know, stage s, I'm going to approximate the infinite binary string k. I'm going to approximate it by some finite binary string. And you might think I want to use, you know, run k up to stage s. And just restrict it to the first s things. But it's actually it's possible that every one of these makes some incorrect guess. Because uh, you know, maybe it takes me a lot of stages to realize I'm wrong here, but I've also got some error up here. Right. And that takes me even longer to realize that that was an error, but in the meantime, I've made a bigger error. But I could always have some errors in each story. And that's not great, right? If I'm if I'm guessing at something, I want to be correct sometimes. You know, not all the time that I'm guessing, but at least some of the time it should be correct. Uh, so you do use these Decker non-deficiency stages. Uh, and the way this works is basically every time you discover an error, you roll everything all the way back to where that error is. So uh, you might imagine that at every stage, you only got one element of interest k, call it uh, ns. 
And well, there's these special stages which, you know, uh, when, when NS enters K, right, that's an error. K, you used to think that this wasn't K, and now you've realized it isn't K. And so sometimes that error is like the least possible error. So there's no error smaller than that. Which means right at no later stage will we ever see some NS that enters that's, that's smaller than, than NS, right? So for every later stage, every other thing that's enumerated is bigger than this thing we just enumerated. Um, so then what we can do is at stage S, we're going to guess that the KS is true up to whatever element just entered K. And then at each of these non-deficiency stages, our guess is actually going to be completely correct. Okay, basically, we, we found an error. We guessed this much previously. We're going to say, I'm going to roll my whole guess back to this new thing. And that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So infinitely often, I'm going to guess uh, a correct thing. And we'll say that a stage is one true if it's guessed at, at K, which is the first jump, that's that one. Uh, is really true, so it's it's an initial segment. Okay. So this is how we're we're doing our, our sort of first level of, of approximations. So I said right, your your one true if your your guess at stage S is true, it's an initial segment. Of, okay. So there's infinitely many one true stages because of this this vector non deficiency. Um, if you've got a one true stage, then it's going to appear one true at any later stage, right? Because once you're one true, you really are an initial segment of K. And, and nothing will change. Uh, if you're not one true, well, that means that there's something that's in K that you haven't seen as in K. And there might be some stages bigger than you that also make that same error, right? If you say something's not in, it doesn't mean it's going to go in immediately. It might take quite a lot of time to go in. And so there's a bunch of stages after you that are also not true. But from their perspective, they might think that you're true, right? So you say that S appears one true at stage T if everything that S gets is compatible with things that T gets, right? So T sort of believes S, right? If T, by stage T, you haven't done an error uh, about stage S. So if you've got such a T, uh, it's also not one true, right? Because it, it believes something else. Okay, and then the main idea of the, the, the sort of true stages, and, and particularly this, this version that, that Montauban has, is that you iterate this idea through the whole hyperarithmetic hierarchy. Or at least up to whatever level you can fix it out of time that you want to go to. So the idea basically right, is, is having approximated some jump, uh, like the alpha jump, um, and say just you've approximated by some finite string. You're now going to use this finite string as an oracle to approximate the next jump. Right? That kind of makes sense. You think right, you, you guess that this looks like this, so you use it as an oracle to compute the next. Uh, at limits, you're going to take joins. Right? So this is what you do at each successive stage. At limits, you're going to take joins. Um, and then you have to be really careful. You have to use non-deficiency stages very carefully to make sure that infinitely often there are things that are true that are correct about the alpha jump. Uh, and maybe not only about the alpha jump, but about everything up to the alpha jump as well. Right? So we're going to say that the S is alpha true if the guess at stage S is correct. Right? This is really an initial setting of the true jump. Um, and we're going to say that not just for the alpha jump, but for every jump up to there as well. So it's not just that like you got to the right answer, but you have to have gotten to the right answer in the correct order that you saw how all the jumps were, were going all the way up. Uh, again, right, it could be that uh, at some stage S, there's a later stage T, and T believes what S thought, right? Even if S is possibly incorrect. So we'll say that the T believes, or S appears alpha for stage T, right? And, and we're gonna use this sort of notation for it, this uh, X is it's less than the alpha T, that means that the, the guesses of stage S uh, agree with the guesses of stage T. Um, the other thing is that everything, right, this is supposed to be a computable approximation. So everything, all this uh, is computable. Right? What the guesses are and who agrees with them. Um, the other thing I should say is that at the, the first level, right, Basically, you were either correct or you were incorrect about something. And if you were incorrect about something, then you'd be incorrect for a while until you became correct. Here, with these, these less than alphas, it's a lot more complicated because right, you can discover that you were incorrect about like a second jump while still thinking you were correct about the first jump, but actually you really are incorrect about the first jump, right? So you can sort of say, ah, I found this mistake up here, but I still believe this, even though this is wrong. So the, the sort of structure of like who believes who starts to get a lot more complicated. Um, and I could like write down a page of all the properties, you, know, you can list all the properties of 
who believes who, and if, if this person believes this, then they also believe that. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, no one's going to read it in slide right now. Uh, and the other thing is, this is actually, this is all morally correct, right? But uh, it's not quite what's going on. You have to make some technical adjustments to make things work out, right? Especially at wind stages and things like that. Um, but it's the idea. Uh, okay, so uh, these are just places, if you want to look up the, the technical details, uh, this is where you can look at. Okay, um, and so these are the two stages where I started with the computer ball and guessing at, at jumps. There's no reason I couldn't relativize it to start at some set X and approximate X and X jump and so on. Um, and in fact, I don't even have to sort of break. Usually, when you think of, of relativizing, you pick your X and you relativize everything to there. I don't even have to be committed to my X. Um, if I've got some initial segment of an X, right, and I'm not committed to the full X, I can still use that approximation. Uh, to start doing these approximations of the jumps, right? So to approximate, you know, x to the alpha at stage s, I actually only have to look at x up to s. So I can really think that it's not it's not x that I'm doing to approximate x to the alpha, right? For a finite string sigma, which is thinking of as you know x to the s for some x that I haven't determined yet, and some of you people know, I can think of sigma as having a guess about the alpha jump. Well, the alpha jump of what? The alpha jump of, of any particular x which I'm not committed to that extends it. Right? So uh, you can think you've got this fair space, right? And you know, here I'll have some guesses about the alpha jump. And it's the alpha jump of any of these things up here. Right? And then I'll define so, so instead of thinking about stages, I really want to think about the, the full strings, right? Because if I have a fair space, I have bare space, right? And I have some sigma, and it's extended by some, say, tau one, and it's also extended by some tau two. When I use tau one as an oracle extending sigma, I might find out different things from if I use tau two as an oracle, right? Maybe when I use tau one as an oracle, some computation converges, it goes into the K. But when I use tau two as an oracle, the computation doesn't converge, right? So instead of using stages, I really should think that, you know, using tau one as a a partial oracle, it may or may not leave sigma as a partial oracle, right? And so it could be that like tau one and tau two are the same length. Tau one does leave sigma, but tau two doesn't leave sigma. Um, okay, and then you'll say that sigma is alpha true for some infinite string, right? Before we just said it was true, but now that being true depends on what the actual path, and I should, that should be bare space actually, not, not enter space. Uh, so you say it's, it's alpha true for some infinite path, uh, and you write like sigma is less than or equal alpha to the infinite path if its guesses are all agreeing with what the guesses, what, what the, the true jump of this infinite path is. Right? So, you know, maybe you have this infinite path x. Maybe this guy is incorrect about the jumps of this guy. So he would be, you know, not a true uh, point. But maybe this guy is correct about very jumps of this one. So then he would be true relative to this. But it could be that you know there's some other y up here, and he is not correct about the jumps of y. Right? So whether he's a, an alpha true or not depends on, on what element of bare space you're, you're thinking of uh, extending. All right. So you get these orderings, right? So, so you've got all these, these finite couples, you get this ordering uh, less than equal alpha. It's got lots of nice properties. Um, for example, it's, it's computable, right? It's not computable on the, the infinite strings because to, to do that, you have to actually know their jumps. But on the finite strings, it's computable. Um, the zeroth level is just extension of strings, right? So the zeroth level is really just your, your classical bare space treatment. Um, they're sort of closed downwards, right? So if tau leaves sigma about the alpha jump, well, then it should believe sigma about all the lower jumps. Uh, true things actually do exist. So if I fix a particular X in bare space, there really are infinitely many things, initial segments of X, that, that are actually correct about their guesses on X, right? So, so true statements really do exist. Um, and the other thing is that this less than alpha is a tree or I think a, a force, right? So it doesn't have necessarily a, a single root as many roots, but then above that, it's, it's a tree. 
So the idea is that it has the same kind of picture that the that, that classical, right? The like the less equal one is just the extensions, the less than equal alpha is just some more complicated tree, right? So remember, uh, I said, you know, maybe this guy doesn't believe this one, but maybe he does believe this. So even though on the, the zero tree, he extends this and this, on the one tree, it might actually look more like this, right? So that even though he extends him as a string, it doesn't extend it on the less than equal to one or less than equal to two. Um, then maybe, you know, there, there might even actually be dead ends, right? There might be people who guess something about the 10th jump, and nobody extending them really has that as their 10th jump. So, so there could also be dead ends here. Uh, and then there's some nice additional properties, and these are the ones that sort of relate to change of topology. Um, if you take, right, classically, if, if you just took a, a sigma and you looked at all the extensions of sigma, that was a basic open set. Here, I want to look at sigma. And I want to look at all the things that extend sigma, but in the less than the alpha relation, right? So all the, the x's where sigma was correct about its guess about x to the alpha. Uh, this is going to be a sigma alpha. I might have been off by one here. So it might be an alpha plus one set, right? Because less than equal zero will be sigma. Now, uh, you get the idea. Uh, and then each uh, sigma, I think again, probably this should be sigma alpha plus one set, uh, is of the form a, and this is light phase sigma alpha plus one. It's of the form a union of these sort of basic sigma alpha sets, right? So a, a CE union of these basic sets. So it's exactly the same picture, right? That the, before it was the open sets were unions of these basic open sets. You can think of this, these, these sigma alpha sets with these unions of basic. Um, uh, sigma alpha sets where, where basic meant that there was some point and you're all the things that extend that on some tree. The only difference is that the tree here is this, this more complicated tree. Um, so particularly, right, you could do the change of topology. You can take all these basic open sets as a basis and you get a Polish topology that extends the standard topology and the open sets are exactly the ones generated by the, the sigma alpha sets. Um, and you notice, right, the, you can think like, why does it have to be light phase? The change of topology only works for countably many sets. It only make countably many sets open. There's only countably many light phase sigma alpha sets. So that's reasonable that, that it's only the light phase ones that, that we can make open. Um, of course, you can relativize, right? This, this less than equal to alpha, this whole tree structure, you can relativize it off to some set y, and then you can talk about the sigmas or alpha relative to y sets. So you can do the same thing to you know, any particular light phase set. Uh, right, and so of course this, this is particularly nice because it, it really looks like the standard topology on airspace, right? the sense that it comes from the tree and, and paths and, and things like that. Uh, and so you can go back to, uh, I was, shouldn't have erased it actually, you can go back to the proof of the, the hausdorff kratowski theorem, and you can get this proof for delta alpha plus one, and you can write it down in exactly the same way, except that every time I talked about the standard tree on, on airspace, you replace it by this tree less than equal Right, and everything works at the end. Right, we construct these open sets. Here, when I write this, right, I just write all the things that alpha extends sigma. And that would be a, a basic and sigma problem. So, uh, that sounds great, right? But uh, this, right, this is already a theorem. What can we do that's, that's new with this kind of uh, analysis? Uh, the answer is that we can say some stuff about wage degrees. Um, so. A wage degree, a wage degree is a way of comparing subsets of pair space. Uh, and the idea is that you know, we earlier we drew the, the sigma alpha sets and the delta two sets and the delta, right, and all these different things. And these are all classes of, of subsets. And the idea of wage degrees is to try to classify all the possible classes, right? There's other ones that exist that, that I never mentioned. And, and wage degrees is, is how you try to compare those. So you say that a, a set A is wage reducible to B, right? And you write A is like wage reducible to B. Uh, if there's a continuous function on bare space where A is the pre-image of B, or I think that the second one is sort of a better way to think of it as a computability theorist, you think of F as this continuous function, right? It's, it's kind of like a, a one one reducibility, uh, or I guess many one reducibility, but on, on bare space with, with continuous functions. 
right? So if you think of continuous assumptions as being sort of simple, then to, to decide membership in A, it's enough to decide membership in B. Uh, the structure, they're they very nice to structure. Uh, they're well-founded and they've got this sort of almost, um, almost linear ordering, right? So when we drew the picture before, sometimes they split off, right, with sigma and pi, but sometimes it sort of goes together like at a delta level. Uh, and the second theorem says that that always happens. So sometimes you, right, it's sort of well-ordered from left to right, uh, and you can only have things that, that separate by two things. And you prove these by, by playing some games, it's wagering. And uh, so to know that the game is always determined, you need the axiom of determinacy. But if the particular set you're talking about are real sets, then you do have real things, right? In, in this, you fail assuming the axiom of determinacy. And so these two things are always true for, for any real sets. Is that known to be false I mean, if um, non real sets are under choice? Uh, it's not known to be false, but I think like it, it's known that it could be. Uh, I don't, is it known that is projective determinacy consistent or just probably consistent? Yeah. Yeah, but not of anything that's like provably consistent, right? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it probably could be true, could be false. Yeah. Um, although I guess it's obviously proves that something is not determined. <laughs> but the question is like how high up is it? And that does end up implying there's some set that where this doesn't go. I haven't thought about that specifically. Okay. Um because actually the so the, the game that you play here is sort of in some sense not as, as strong as like the full strength of determinants. So for all determinacy requires a whole bunch of iterations of power set. Uh, right, particularly our omega one iterations of the power set axiom. And even by looking at sigma four sets, you can't do it in second order arrangement. Uh, on the other hand, if you only care about the particular games that you play for, for wage degrees, um, these, uh, or at least it, um, you can get these to be determined in second order arithmetic. Right, so somehow the, the wage games are, are simpler than just arbitrary games in general. Um, this was a result of Lugo and Standard Mon. That, that you can prove Borel wage determinacy uh, in second order arithmetic. Uh, the proof is, is quite complicated. Basically, the way you prove things like this is that you know that open games or closed games right, are, are determined. And there's, you, know, you can prove that in second order arithmetic. And then you've got this sort of way, like, like an unraveling of this much more complicated game, where you say, sort of, I got this. this like less complicated in the topological sense, maybe, but more complicated in the you know, writing down sense game that, that controls that game. And then you unravel it more and it more, and, and you get this sort of much more complicated game for a human, but, but simpler in the sense that it becomes like an open game. Um, and there's also all sorts of like comprehensive de descriptions of what all the Borel wage classes are. Uh, these are some of the people who do various different ones, and sometimes in. in um, more general context. Um, and we could use the, the true state machinery that I talked about before to give a new description of these Borel wage classes uh, and to prove Borel wage determinacy, and not just in some fragment of second order, but in a, in a reasonable fact. Right? So you can think of this as, as in some sense, a, a, like a reverse math of uh, wage determinacy. Um, and in particular, you can prove it in ATR naught plus pi 1 1 induction. Right, so ATR or not, you're going to need because you're talking about ordinals, so it's only natural that, that you shouldn't be uh, requiring ATR or not. And then pi 1 induction is really just about the first order part, uh, and that's to make certain things that they are going to go through. Uh, and you get a complete description of, of the world wage classes. Um, so you can read the paper if you want to know what that, that description is. Um, right, so particularly you get these, these theorems of wage that uh, right, you're semi-linearly ordered and, and well done. Um, so it simplifies the, the original proof of this uh, in second order arithmetic, and, and you get particularly this sort of weaker subsystem that, that you know with this. Um, and the other for computability theories, it's nice because the descriptions of the classes are sort of dynamic. Um, right? When we did the the alpha proxy argument, it was a sort of dynamic view of as you went along the set, you had the limit on the and, and all the descriptions have that same kind of uh, 
Uh, and naturally, you get all the light pixels of this image. Uh, so what's the, the general idea of the argument? How do you prove something like this? Uh, well, you make a list of all these, these classes, right? You have sort of a list, and you're going to claim that this list is all the classes. So you, you have certain descriptions of classes that you call described classes. You make a list of them. Uh, and generally, what you do is you only list, right, there's these sort of splittings, the sigma alpha versus pi alpha. You only describe the things on, on one half. So these are right, things where they, they have a, there's a dual. Uh, and these are the non self dual loops, right? So, so you're describing like sigma to uh, d sigma to uh, things like that, right? You're not describing things like delta phi, and you're not describing things like phi. Um, then you prove uh, something called a Lubos Saint Ramon type separation result for each of the described classes, which says that either something is universal for this class. Uh, so you know, if something is, if A is universal for the class and B is some Borel set, then either A reduces to B or B is in the dual class, in which case B reduces to the complement. Okay, so you sort of say, you know, for any A, you've also got the, the dual class, right, which the complement is in. And so either your B is here, your A reduces to B, or you've got the B reduces to the A complement. Right? And so that's sort of your, your semi well ordering. Um, but then you've got this description, right? So, so this is kind of like what Shep asked at the very beginning about delta two and, and delta three. Uh, right? You have, you know, say delta three or this dual class in general, and you've got all the things below it. Do all the things below it sort of Make it up, right? Is it is it like the the union of all the classes below, or is it it's like a class in its own right? So, for example, delta one that's a class in its own right. It's not a union of smaller things. Delta two right is a union of these different hierarchies. So, the idea is when you've got um, sort of this this right, the strut class in the dual, uh, there's sort of two cases, right? One is maybe it's a, a wage class in its own right, and if it's not, then you argue that it must be a union. Of the lower wage classes, just sort of generalizing this kind of result, right? But the more complicated classes with more complicated descriptions. And so then the, the general form of the argument is you say, okay, suppose I've got some Borel set. Uh, take the least described class that contains it, right? So I know it's if it's Borel, it's sigma alpha or some alpha. So there's one of my classes is bigger than that, right? So it's under some class. Take the least description that contains it. Or maybe the dual or, or the delta. And then I prove that it's complete for that class, basically using this kind of result and using that kind of result. All right, so you basically say, take, you know, to, to show that something in a particular wage degree, I say take the least wage degree containing it and prove that it must be in that. Okay, so I said there's this sort of uh both saying Raymond sort of uh, separation type result. Um, and this is really, in some sense, the, the key. I guess there's two keys, right? One is this algebra for thing. I've already talked about that kind of result. But then there's also this kind of thing. So the yeah, idea is you've got these, this, this set A, which is in some class gamma, which you, you've got some kind of description. So just think of it as like sigma alpha. If you take gamma to be sigma alpha, you won't lose any, any ideas. And then you've got this B0, and you've got B1. So you can think you've got, you know, this is all of bare space, and you've got A, and you've got A complement. And you want to do one of two things. One option is you could get a continuous reduction from A and A complement to B0 and B1. Okay, so you get that this reduces to here, and that reduces to here. Right? So a continuous function maps A to B0. And A's complement to B1. Or the other option is that maybe you can separate them. And the separator is going to be the opposite, right? So if this is sigma alpha, that's pi alpha. The other option is you could separate them, right? Some separator, right? And then this would be pi alpha. And this would be sigma zero. Um, so that's the sort of the, the idea of the result, right? Either you can do this reduction or you can separate the two things. And uh, one way you could do it would be to, to do sort of a naturally associated game. Uh, the games are always of the following form. 
one player is going to play an element that's either in A or A common. Right? So player one is going to play a max, which is in one of these two things. Player B is going to play a Y. Y, the idea of Y can be either in here or it's going to be in here. But player B also has to witness that it's in one of the two. Right? So player one is going to play some X. Player two is going to play some Y, but they're also going to play some Z. And the Z is going to witness that Y is in this one, or it's going to witness that Y is in this one. So X is in A or a complement. And then Z witnesses that Y is in B0 or B1. Right. So this the Z is where you use the, the sigma one ones, right? That if, if you're in B0, there's a witness. If you're in B1, then there's a witness. So you can see that, um, right, and then you say, okay, when does uh, player two win? Player two wins if they really, their strategy builds this reduction, right? So player two wins if when X is in A, they really build Y in B0. And if X is in A complement, then they really build Y in B0. Right, so if player one, if player two wins, then you actually get this reduction. Then you have to argue, well, if player one wins, then you have a strategy for player one. And from that, you expect to separate. So this kind of game, right, is is a, a Borel game uh, because you're asking about you know things in, in various Borel sets, things like that. So again, Borel determines you could play this game. Um, but Lebo and Saint Ramon they use this unraveling process to, to associate it with you. And using the true stages, there's a, a better way to understand a game like this, right? Without doing any unraveling, just to just sort of define a game. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but I just want to give you sort of an idea of what's going on. Uh, so basically, the idea is, is so you've got this, this uh, it's like gamma, right? For simplicity, it's like uh, a sigma set. And these Bs, right, they're sigma 1, 1, so they're projections of some tree. So you fix the two trees, right? When I say Z, I say it's really, I mean that you know, Y and Z are in that tree. Or Z and Y are in the screen. So player one, like before, he's going to play this this X, and it's either going to be an A or A complement. Player two, he's going to play this Y, right? Y has to be in B zero or B one, and again, he's going to play this witness, um, which I guess in here I call F, but but here I wrote Z, right? So this witness uh, of of which tree you're, in. and. At each stage, right, each person plays an extra bit of X in their Y. But the difference is right, that each stage player two has to also build a little bit of, of this witness that are F. But whereas X and Y, they're just going to be the unions of everything that everyone played, right? So any bit you play is, is put together in X. The witness you build is really only going to be the witness along certain true stages. So two is allowed to change of mind about what the witness is. But he's only allowed to change his mind at very determined places where, where something happens along the true stages, right? So you've got sort of guesses at whether X is in the set or not, right? whether X is an A or a complement. Those guesses are happening along certain stages, and every time that changes or, or something changes, uh, he's allowed to change his set, right? And if you do that, it turns out that it ends up actually just being a, uh, an open game for player one, right? And then you just use open determinants. But sort of this, this idea that if you change the witnesses along the true stages in the right kind of guess, um, then, then really the game just becomes open. Right? And then open games are determined. Uh, so that's how that kind of argument goes. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the idea, right? So then you get uh, the railway determinacy and A to not plus I one mean uh, So here's the two papers. Uh, if you want to look at the, the details, because I think it, you know the, the details are important if you ever want to use it. And I think it's an interesting idea that it, you know should keep it in your mind in case you ever see something where it could be applied. Um, so the, the first one is just sort of the general idea, so constructing how the how the true stages go and, and things like that. And then the second one is this much more intensive application to, to the overall of So I would say if you're going to read something, read, read the first one, see how that goes. Um, but I think the first one doesn't really have any like new results in it. It's just how the setup is, and the second one is where you, you actually prove uh, that the thing in here. So the, the yeah. last theorem is what you proved in the last second paper. Yeah. What was the theorem? You just put it back on the slide. Thanks. 
Any questions for Matthew? I mean, let's thank Matthew again. So Dennis said that, you know, this is the 30th version of this. That means we've been doing this for 15 years. And more right. years than, no, I looked it up 15 yes. years. Don't, 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 don't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been 15 years that we've been doing this, right? I mean, so uh, Joe and Dennis and, you know, and I, and also Antonio initially put this together. But you know what? Thank, thank you for thanking me, but really without you guys coming, we wouldn't have this conference, right? And I think it's been a great uh, venue to hear computability. I look back through the talks that we've had over the last, you know, 15 years, and it's been a great, great place, right? So thank, thank you guys for coming and be part of this, and I hope we can continue for another 15 years. So anyway. <laughs> That's it, let's see. Yeah, so dinner will be at, not a lot of anybody, uh, well, anybody who doesn't know how to get there, like what he does, but it's 